Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Berry. I'm a medical oncologist, professor and head of the Department of Oncology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak at this Choosing Wisely meeting. Choosing Wisely Africa is an incredibly important initiative. I wish I could be there with you, but happy to contribute to the meeting from afar. Um, I'm going to be talking about how clinical practice guidelines can help clinicians choose wisely. This is a picture of my hometown, Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Um, last weekend, our the temperatures here were down to minus between minus 20 and minus 30 Celsius. It's warmed up a little bit now, but uh, very cold this time of year. Um, you've likely seen this many times at this meeting, but uh, this was a very important publication in the Journal of Global Oncology, um, Choosing Wisely Africa, 10 Low Value or Harmful Practice That Should Be Avoided in Cancer Care. This was led by Dr. Fidel Rubagumia, uh, his colleagues from across Africa, and some of uh, my colleagues in Queens also contributed. And it's important to realize that for some of these practices, you need evidence to make these decisions. And even if you're an expert in critical appraisal, there are sometimes dozens of trials and meta-analyses that would contribute to that decision-making. Clinical practice guidelines are one way of managing this. Clinical practice treatment guidelines provide clinicians with a framework of recommendations for evidence-based therapies. Guidelines can improve the quality of clinical decision-making, facilitate care delivery, optimize patient outcomes, and may also inform government spending policies. There's a number of organizations that uh, create these. Um, some of the better known ones are the NCCN guidelines in America. Um, there's been some good work done, and I'll be talking about this, led by Dr. Amir Mutebi and uh, colleagues in the African Cancer Coalition to develop national comprehensive cancer network harmonized guidelines for Sub-Saharan Africa. The American Society of Clinical Oncology um, has a guideline uh, set, National Cancer Grid of India, and the European Society of Medical Oncology. You may have seen these in various forms. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you, um, I'm gonna start with a case um, related to a guideline I recently developed uh, with the organization I work with, the Cancer Care Ontario Program and Evidence-Based Care, um, to highlight uh, the guideline development process in Canada. Uh, Sheila McNair is the managing director and contributed uh, slides for this presentation. I'd like to thank her for that. I'm the co-chair of the Cancer Care Ontario Program and Evidence-Based Care, uh, the gastrointestinal disease site group. And um, I'm going to go through a guideline we recently produced for advanced gastric cancer to highlight some of the important points. Um, go through um, how to use a clinical practice guideline to aid clinical decision-making, and to choose wisely and look at some of the um, important and key elements that make up a rigorous and useful guideline. I'm gonna talk about some of the limitations with the Canadian model. And I'm gonna finish with a guideline development examples from low and middle income countries, including talking more about the NCCN harmonized guidelines for Sub-Saharan Africa and the guideline process of the Indian National Cancer Grid. So I'm gonna start with my case. Um, a 58-year-old man previously fit with no comorbidities presents to the casualty department with hematemesis. He has three-month history of early society and a 20-pound weight loss. He has a gastroscopy, and that shows a fundal ulcer that was biopsied. It shows an adenocarcinoma that does, did not dis demonstrate any HER2 overexpression. A CT scan done shows multiple liver metastases and peritoneal metastases. His labs showed uh, that he was anemic. He had a mild increase in his transaminases, but they're less than two times the upper limit of normal and a normal bilirubin. Now, as you know, there are many different treatment options for uh, a patient like this. They can get infusional 5-FU and platinum, capecitabine and platinum, infusional 5-FU and oxaliplatin, capecitabine and oxaliplatin, infusional 5-FU and arinotecan, 5-FU docetaxel and platinum. And in some cases, the use of nivolumab could be considered. And the question is, 
for a clinician in the working in the clinic is how can I choose the best treatment wisely for this patient? And as I said, even if you're an expert in critical appraisal, there are dozens of trials and meta-analyses that would contribute to a decision like this. So I'm gonna um, focus a little bit first on uh, the guideline process in Canada and specifically the Cancer Care Ontario program and evidence-based care that I work with. The program at evidence-based care since 1993 has worked with people from across Ontario to develop evidence-based guidance documents to enhance the culture and capacity to use and appreciate the value and role of evidence, to apply, apply formal, explicit, and rigorous methods of evidence synthesis. And these guidance documents support the evolution and sustainability of an evidence-informed culture for care delivery, uh, really a culture of choosing wisely. Just to give you an idea, since 1993, this group has developed more than 350 guidelines, evidence summaries, and other reports, um, and more than 230 journal publications. Um, in terms of topics, um, the topics are identified by Cancer Care Ontario programs. Cancer Care Ontario is the provincial cancer agency in Ontario, one of the largest provinces in Canada. Um, there are cancer advisory committees that are um, prioritized um, uh, that contribute to these decisions, and these decisions are prioritized centrally at Cancer Care Ontario. In terms of what gets prioritized, um, they have to be aligned with CCO clinical pathways. Where are the gaps? Um, they also consider um, other clinical and methodological considerations, such as the prevalence of the condition and the burden of illness in our province, the relevance to our local practice, um, identification of variations in practice that reflect poor quality, uh, the likelihood of changing practice uh, through the guideline use and the availability of evidence. So the guideline development requires a great team at this, uh, at the program at evidence-based care. This uh, requires a large staff who has uh, developed the methods, process, evidence expertise and resources to do this work. Um, and they uh, report transparently and explicitly. It also includes a large number of providers, um, clinicians from across the province who volunteer their time. Um, these providers have content expertise um, in both in the research and the clinical discipline. They have the opportunity to interpret evidence and judge applicability in specific clinical situations. And they have the ability to um, think carefully about the trade-offs and balance between benefits and harms uh, uh, given their experience in working with patients. Patients and families are also involved to give the appropriate perspective, um, a reality check, and to contribute to the values um, which are really patient and family centered um, because that's what who these guidelines are ultimately created for. There is a rigorous process for the program at Evans Based Care. Um, it starts with initiation, um, identifying a topic and guideline. Um, this includes um, the guideline development group members um, who use the process that I talked about on the previous slide. There's then a, uh, a robust planning process where um, the objectives are developed. The research questions and criteria are uh, also developed. And then um, other project planning issues like the scope of the project and the timeline are um, developed as well. Um, step three is document development where we have evidence review. Recommendations are crafted from the evidence review and synthesis, and there's a development of the first draft of the document. Um, step number four, and this is a really important step, is both internal and external review. There's a review internally by a methodology panel um, and a guideline development group expert panel. And there's also external review by content experts and target users. And then finally, this um, guideline uh, is published, it's published on the Cancer Care Ontario website. And the uh, URL for that uh, guideline website is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we also publish uh, these guidelines in peer reviewed journals and then focus on, um, uh, focus on implementation. So it's a rigorous process. 
um, conflict of interest is uh, managed carefully. And there is regular review of the guidelines once they're published to ensure they reflect up-to-date uh, evidence and up-to-date practice. So in terms of how to use a guideline to choose wisely, uh, there's some key questions to ask. Um, in terms of some resources, if you'd like to learn more about this um, in developing uh, these key questions to ask, um, there's a really good uh, article in JAMA in 2021 by Green Yardalo Peterson and colleagues, how to interpret and use a clinical practice guideline and recommendation. Um, this is part of the user's guides to the medical li literature series. And there's also the agree to instrument, which is allows is a, a very uh, a, a very comprehensive document on the appraisal of guidelines for research and evaluation if you'd like to learn more about this. Um, as I said, we recently published a guideline for systemic therapy for advanced gastric and gastroesophageal carcinoma. And I am going to use this to illustrate some of the key questions you might want to ask while you're using a guideline like this to apply it to a clinical question like the, uh, for the patient that we saw in the case that I presented. So you can see that um, this Cancer Care Ontario guideline is very comprehensive. It's more than 100 pages long. Um, it has many important uh, sections. Um, section one is recommendations. Section two um, are the uh, recommendations and key evidence. There's a guideline methods overview in section three. Um, section four is the systematic review. Section five is the internal and external review that I spoke about and multiple important uh, appendices uh, to support the main document. So some questions um, as you're going through this uh, guideline, any guideline really to help you choose uh, treatment wisely. Uh, was the evidence summarized with rig rigorous systematic review methods? And you can see in our guideline or any rigorous guideline, there should be a very good literature search strategy shown and a Prisma flow diagram, which clearly describes um, the uh, number of publications that were identified in this search um, and how they were um, uh, uh, reviewed and excluded. And finally, how many uh, actual studies were included in the evidence base. So you can see that um, through the search strategy, we ultimately identified 59 uh, papers that contributed to the um, clinical practice guideline. So another important question was, was the evidence summarized with rigorous systematic review methods? And you can see in our guideline, these are extracts. Uh, th this would have happened for each randomized study or each systematic review in the system in the randomized studies. Um, they use the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment Tool to look at things like whether there was random sequence generation, allocation concealment, blinding, and other key elements of uh, a randomized clinical trial. Um, there's also uh, a rigorous assessment of systematic reviews using another tool, um, and they look at um, important criteria like whether there was an a prior design, um, whether there's a comprehensive literature search, a list of included and excluded studies, study quality and study quality assessment, and other um, important uh, uh, elements of a rigorous systematic review. So, when you're looking through a clinical practice guideline, you need to make sure that the authors of that guideline have gone through randomized studies and meta analyses and, and reviewed them using some systematic process. Some other important questions, are the patients and interventions clear? And did the guideline consider outcomes that are important to patients? Um, you can see here that um, uh, in our guideline, we um, outlined the objectives, which was to provide guidance on the optimal sy uh, systemic therapies for the treatment of advanced gastric and gastroesophageal junction carcinoma. And in terms of being important to patients, we think we looked at the things that are most important to patients, which are, we looked at the optimal systemic therapies that were defined as those that provided improved overall survival and improved quality of life. 
they help they either had to help patients live longer or live better. And those are the two criteria that we used um, in uh, both um, in, in defining the outcomes that were um, important um, to patients and important to the guideline. So this was a very thorough guideline, but it's, as I said, more than 107 pages. So I think it's important to identify, is there a concise summary? I think that it's important to be rigorous. Some, page, some people may want to go through um, all of the 107 pages or significant portions of it, but that for busy clinicians, um, a concise summary that they can refer to in the clinic um, may, be, may, may be another valuable component of a guideline. So we have a two-page summary of just the recommendations, and I'll be going through a few of those. And then there's also a seven-page summary that provides not only the recommendations, but some of the qualifying statements, a summary of the key evidence, and justification for the recommendations based on evidence. So here's um, an example of uh, some of the um, actual recommendations. And again, some of the important questions to ask, are the recommended actions and strength of recommendations clear? And you can see here that we try and use very clear language. Medical oncologists should prescribe either a flor flor fluoroprimidine oxaloplatin doublet or a fluoroprimidine irinotecan doublet um, in the first line treatment of these patients. There are some qualifying statements. Um, we say that based on improved efficacy with fl fluoroprimidine oxaloplatin taxane um, can be uh, um, based on improved efficacy with fluoroprimidine oxaloplatin taxane. This triplet regimen may be discussed with selected fit patients as an alternative to a doublet regimen. So we've highlighted a couple of the doublets that we would um, uh, think that should be prescribed, either a fluoroprimidine oxaloplatin doublet or a fluoroprimidine irinotecan doublet. And those are the ones that would be uh, relevant for most patients. The evidence behind this is uh, clearly documented. Um, this was based on some important meta-analyses, but we also go through other options like a triplet regimen. And we uh, highlight that um, that one though is for a more limited group of patients. They have to be fit and that you have to discuss um, the increased toxicity with patients. We also make um, clear recommendations against certain, um, certain treatments and that in patients with non-HER2 overexpressing tumors, you should not prescribe a biological agent in addition to first-line chemotherapy agents. So again, in helping clinicians choose wisely, it's important not only to um, identify the things that have the most value for patients, but also to identify things like adding a biological agent like bevacizumab, for instance, which would have no value in this group. Um, there are different uh, classification systems uh, that um, contribute to, to help classify the strength of recommendations. Um, and usually they um, go through a hierarchy. Um, if, you, if, if there's a definite agreement that you should use the intervention, um, the American Heart Association calls that class one. Um, the grade group um, says there's a strong four. The NICE group from the UK uses language like must offer, refer, and advise. And you can see that depending on the level of evidence and the um, confidence in the, in the evidence, um, you use, for instance, NICE would say, um, consider uh, if there's uh, less rigorous evidence to support it. So I think that um, there are various systems, but I think that it's important. Uh, we used a, a system where we said should use or should not use uh, for the highest levels of evidence. And, and this uh, type of language can be uh, linked to the confidence in the evidence that's being uh, used. Um, this is an NCCN guideline. And I think that um, the NCCN guideline, um, they do have some preferred regimens. They also have some other recommended regimens. Um, I think the problem is, is that they don't give a lot of guidance. As an example, um, they do give some good guidance up here. Oxaloplatin is generally preferred over cisplatin due to lower toxicity. They do identify some preferred regimens like ours, which is a fluoroprimidine platinum doublet. But then there's a lot of other recommend, uh, recommended regimens and they don't give a lot of context. As an example, 
the combination of fluorouracil and arenotecan in large meta-analyses has actually been shown to be equivalent in terms of efficacy to fluoroprimidine platinum doublets. And in our guideline, we made sure to make, make sure that that is, um, was equally uh, a reasonable option um, to some of the fluoroprimidine and platinum doublets. They comment that docetaxel, cisplatin, and fluorouracil is another is a other recommended regimen, but unlike our guideline, don't point out that this is really only for selected fit patients, and it is a more toxic regimen. So I think that um, I would beware of non-specific recommendations, and I think because I think that um, they are less able to help you make specific decisions for specific patients. Um, so we're, we're proud of the rigor um, of our Cancer Care Ontario program evidence-based care uh, guidelines, um, but there are some limitations. Uh, we haven't done as good a job, I think, we, as we could have in evaluation of the implementation and impact of these, um, of these guidelines. Also in our guidelines, we do not comment on the economic value or cost effectiveness, but we do have a parallel national evidence-based drug funding program to evaluate drug value. The other thing is, is that these guidelines require a large investment. And I've commented on this before, um, there are 14 health re research methodologists, three program staff to provide administ administrative support, manage uh, the review of the process. There are students and there are three leaders who guide all this. And that requires a lot of um, time, money, uh, uh, and uh, space infrastructure. So it does require a large investment and resources. And um, it's it's important to note that uh, you know that alternate strategies for settings where there may be fewer resources um, are important. So I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Um, one of the most important is, um, I've talked about this paper briefly before, this was um, a process, uh, the development of a national comprehensive cancer network harmonized guidelines for sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the process for this was described in detail in a paper in JCO Global Oncology. Uh, the first author was Miriam Mutebi on behalf of the African Cancer Co uh, Coalition. And the key thing here was, um, Adapting um, high resource guidelines where, uh, like the Cancer Care Ontario, or in this case, NCCN, and looking at um, how international cancer treatment guidance should be adjusted to be useful and appropriate for African treatment programs. And this article describes an effort by more than 100 African oncologists to develop regional treatment guidelines for the continent to provide high quality treatment that is practical for the African setting. So the importance of having context specific uh, and focused uh, and adaptive guidelines that focus on a specific area. The overall goal, as with other guidelines, is to improve the quality of cancer care and to tailor, again, tailor the care to the unique settings of African cancer centers. And again, they aim to address different resource settings to enhance best practices, um, irrespective of resources. So here's an example of the NCCN harmonized guideline for sub-Saharan Africa. This is for gastric cancer. And um, just in terms of uh, adapting these, there is a color coded framework that uh, would be used to adapt high resource, uh, resource, sorry, to adapt guidelines from a high resource setting like America. And those, um, there are recommendations in black which refer to generally available services such as standard chemotherapy and radiotherapy that, be, that can be considered reasonable standard of care, not only in sub-Saharan Africa, but in the world over and will be included in a package of minimum standards for comprehensive care. And that includes um, the fluoroprimidine platin doublets, as well as the fluoroprimidine and arenotecan doublets. It also includes recommendations in gray, and they refer to highly advanced or optimal care recommendations that may be costly, technically challenging, and or less impactful um, on oncologic outcomes, such as immunotherapy or positron emission tomography and community tomography. And again, um, 
this is important uh, in very important in the um, process of choosing treatments wisely. And sorry, just as an example, this for, for an example would include triplet regimens that are, are um, more toxic and may be challenging to give in certain settings on the continent. And then recommendations in blue, I refer to regional options that have been added for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and there's none in this particular guideline, but these additions are made to provide additional op options to be used when resource availability, availability precludes general standard of care. Um, these guidelines are available at the URL below. Um, I'd like to talk about one other approach uh, that's used to develop guidelines in India. This was outlined in a paper um, by Manju's, Dr. Manju Singar and her colleagues at the Tata Memorial uh, was the leader and she worked with colleagues from across India. Um, this was published in BMJ Global Health last year. And in many ways, this is very similar to um, the idea of the NCCN harmonized guidelines for Sub-Saharan Africa. They identify a guideline topic. They screen relevant guidelines from high resource settings for methodologic quality. And then they can either adopt the recommendation, contextualize it um, for the Indian, uh, in, Indian uh, context um, if needed, update the recommendation, or develop new clinical review questions if the source guidelines do not include priority questions for India. So again, this very important idea of contextual of using uh, guidelines from high resource settings that are rigorous, um, and but then adapting them to the context and setting um, uh, where they're going to be used. One of the important uh, extra steps in this is that they do undertake a review and economic analysis. So th the other key element of this uh, process is that um, after uh, they do their economic analysis, they develop different levels of resource stratification based on um, that economic analysis. And this classification is specifically designed for implementing the guidelines in India and links directly to the national funding program. This is actually one of the largest funding programs in the world. And I think that linking the guidelines to funding provides an extra layer of um, ensuring that um, evidence-based guidelines um, and high value cancer care is optimized, which is a really important concept um, in the choosing wisely process. Great quote from Dr. Sengar's paper, that highlights some of the points that's been made is that clinical guidelines can only bring benefits if they've been rigorous, rigorously developed, evident, that they're evidence-based, that they're contextually sound, that they um, have to, if they're gonna be adapted, they need to be adapted appropriately to the context or setting where they're gonna be used, whether that's India or um, Africa, and they need to be acceptable by clinicians who are aware of their existence for incorporation into clinical practice. So to summarize, um, significant resources are required, and that includes time, money, um, volunteers, uh, infrastructure to create high quality evidence-based guidelines that can help clinicians choose wisely. Um, we're proud of the system that we have in Ontario, but recognize that uh, the resources that are needed Adapting rigorous guidelines from higher resource settings to the specific context and setting um, in lower resource settings as being done in Africa and India is an excellent model. And uh, uh, given you a couple of examples, uh, the NCCN harmonized guidelines for Sub-Saharan Africa and the process used by the National Cancer Grid and that um, linking guideline recommendations to funding may help ensure that people choose wisely. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, once again, thanks to the organizers for um, the opportunity to speak and to uh, give you some ideas on uh, how clinical practice guidelines may um, help uh, the Choosing Wisely initiatives. And once again, uh, very sorry I couldn't be there, um, but look forward to seeing you um, uh, perhaps later this year at the aortic meeting. So, um, Thanks again uh, and uh, take care.